Thank you for joining us for another Thursday's Reunited, where our goal is to reunite the body of Christ with the gospel of the kingdom of God. My name is Corey Pritchard, uh, actually recording this uh, <laughs> this Thursday from my basement. So if it looks a little bit, uh, you know, vintage, <laughs> I guess, then you know that it definitely is. Uh, I do record this from my home. I have three kids and a wife uh, that are here. So at different times, I have to record at different places to see if I can get the most uh, out of the space that we have. So this is, you know, kind of where we are. Uh, but don't let, you know, that uh, discourage you in any way. Uh, if you are listening to this and it's a case where you're uh, from another part of the world, you could be another part of the country, you could be anywhere, right? Uh, then don't think that this is going to dictate the, the content or the quality of the content of what we have going on and what we've been doing through these sessions. And I said this this last week, but I have to make sure I reiterate is that we are in a class. We are literally learning about the kingdom of God and the kingdom of heaven together. Uh, the goal is, like I said, to reunite the body of Christ with the gospel of the kingdom of God. And one of the most uh, detrimental things that we find is division. And tonight's uh, parable is really going to dig into that. And we're going to understand how that works and why it's so dangerous to kingdoms. I believe it's a really powerful time. So I'm ex excited about it. Uh, so with that being said, just want to make sure I can open this up, first of all, uh, to ask any questions to, to anybody that may be on here to see if you have something that, that maybe you'd like to share as you've been studying about the kingdom of God uh, or if there's something that you've been getting out of the Bible or the, the, the classes out of the uh, Thursday night reunites that we've been doing. Uh, Lionel actually mentioned that he uh, really enjoyed last week's uh, class. He said that he actually listened to it multiple times. He was able to get you know, something out of it. So he didn't just listen to it once. He went back through it multiple times. So this is a great time if you'd like to share anything about the kingdom of God, kingdom of heaven, or about reunited of what you've been studying. If you'd like to share that, it'd be a great time before we move forward. Anybody like to share anything before we move forward? All right. Well, you feel free. Okay, you want to share something, Emerson? I'm going to share as much as I can. Uh, I might have to stop. Uh, I'm at work, so it's kind of awkward. But, uh, yeah, it's something I've been studying. And uh, one of the things that I've been studying is that uh, we have to definitely begin to, if you want to get anything out of these, these things that we're talking about, you have to definitely change your mindset. Uh, you have to understand, number one, and this was for me, so I'm speaking from a personal standpoint, is that that I, myself, uh and, 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 and really, and I am, I am not, it's just dumb to me. I am really not from here. You know, and when you start talking like that, man, if you, if you don't have the same mindset, I'm thinking that, yeah, because the, the word of God kind of bears out, you know, we're, we're in this world, but we're not of it. And I know, my God, that's true. You know, so that's, that's been my study for the day, is to have a whole different mindset and realize that I'll just have to, uh, you know, as, as, as my uh, brother Miles put it, colonizing the earth with the, with the purpose of heaven. And uh, I realized one thing, too, is that you can't colonize someplace that you're from. <laughs> you have to be from somewhere else. I said, my God, it's just me. I just wanted to share a little bit of that uh, with you, and I'm continuing to eat on that word uh, for a minute. I'm like, man, I, I, that's, that's just been something for my week. So, yeah, that's about it, bro. Outstanding. Thank you for sharing that, Emerson. Uh, anybody else have anything they'd like to share before we move forward? All right. Well, awesome stuff. So what Emerson's saying is totally true. Uh, if you haven't already fully started to immerse yourself and engage in the process of really starting to understand the kingdom of God, then I encourage you to do that. Uh, one thing that I, I suggested, I'm not sure how many uh, of us have actually taken, you know, taken that uh, responsibility or that journey is what I'll call it. Uh, which is actually go through and read every scripture that actually has the kingdom of God. So I suggest that you go through a a Bible concordance. I don't care where you get it from, just some type of reference tool where you can actually isolate and pinpoint uh, the scriptures that talk specifically about the kingdom of God. Right. Read those scriptures, read everything above, below. Uh, and, and you can keep that in context, but at least you'll see how how um, consistent. Uh, it is that this topic comes up. So it's not a, a one word thing, right? It's not just just something that comes up once or twice, even 10 times, right? It's just so, so numerous that it comes up. And then if you add in uh, the kingdom of heaven, right, you add in doing the same thing, reading through all the scriptures to say the kingdom of God, kingdom of heaven. And you'll see it's like, man, if nothing else, just from the first time going through, this is something 
that you, you're like, why haven't I heard more about this and dealing with, uh, you know, the, the body of Christ? Why haven't I, why haven't I heard more about it? And then the last way that I suggest that you go through is just type in the word kingdom. And this is really mind blowing for me as I go back through it, you know, numerous times is that you see that the, the entire Bible is talking kingdoms. The conversation pretty much goes from Genesis to Revelation, you know, talking about kingdoms. And then when you get into the New Testament on the, under the New Covenant, it's amazing how consistent God is talking about kingdom. And when he says kingdom, he's talking about his kingdom, right? He's talking about the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven. So again, all I'm saying is if it's an important thing to God, shouldn't it be an important thing to you, right? Especially if you confess hope of faith in Jesus Christ, you consider yourself to be a citizen of the kingdom of God. How is it that, that, that Jesus could command us in Matthew 6 and 33 to seek first the kingdom of God, all of his righteousness? And that is a promise. We have everything added unto us, but then we still choose not to seek it at all. Right. Or, 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 or leave it even top of our list. You know, even top five on our list is that we'll look, we'll put faith, right? Love. We'll put all these other topics above the kingdom of God. It's just an amazing thing how we can totally miss, totally miss uh, some something that's really, really important like that. So that's something I would highly suggest you do, and that and that gets in alignment with what Emerson is saying about having a renewal of your mind. Really, just getting and and understanding that you can't take an old mindset and try to squeeze in the kingdom into an old mindset. It's just not going to happen. <laughs> it's, just, it's, it's, it's a bad deal to even try that. So with that being said, we're going to get into our parable uh, tonight. And the parable tonight is actually found in Mark chapter three. So if you are ready to get into that, go ahead and go to Mark chapter three. And the way I'll do it is just making sure I set the stage. I have to say this. If I don't, again, we'll, we'll try to go back into some old habits is that when we're dealing with parables, and I mentioned this, this is in Matthew uh, chapter 13, also in uh, Mark chapter 8, and then also in Luke chapter 4, when we look at these, uh, these very, actually, sorry about that, Mark 4 and Luke 8, when we look at those parables, the parable of the sower is actually establishing a lot of, a lot of really good things as we deal with parables. But more specifically, understanding that when we deal with Jesus Christ uniquely, is that he is actually saying what God the Father said. So listen to what I'm saying. So yes, we can read the entire Bible, but Jesus specifically says, I only say what I have heard, right? He said that. He says that I am doing what I saw my father do. And he says that he is doing the commands or commandments of his father. Listen to what's going on, right? He says that his doctrine is not his own. Right. So if his doctrine is not his, it means his doctrine is his father's. He says, says that. Right. These are consistent things we've gone over in in previous uh, times together. But we have to make sure that we keep this in mind. Why? If we don't, then we put ourselves back into an old religious context and a mindset where we don't get out the things that God wants us to get out. He's establishing his truths through Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ came flesh. Right. This word became flesh to establish the will of God. So when we see that in Matthew 6 and 33, we don't have to question the will of God. We don't have to question that. Jesus Christ is establishing the will of God. And that's what we're making sure that we can learn. So when we get into uh, scriptures like we're getting into tonight, then it's a, lot, it's a case where we say, wow, let me look at this in a deeper way, right? If this is your first time looking at it, it's almost better that it is the first time that you actually look at it, okay? So what I, what I wanted to start with is a few words, and we'll come across these words. I'm going to go ahead and establish some of these words before we actually get into the verses that we're going to get into. One is this word Beelzebub, right? And we've actually uh, maybe heard of it, maybe seen it possibly in different places, but if you haven't, it's okay. Uh, it's just a case where we'll see this word Beelzebub is going to be Elzebub is going to come up in the parable. So what I did is, is go out into a Bible concordance. OK, I looked at the Greek word and of the place we're actually going to see it in Scripture. And the way that it translates translates is Lord of the house. OK, and that lines up with another place and other places that this word is actually used. But it says Lord of the house. OK, and it is a definition is saying specifically is talking about. Uh, a name of Satan. OK, so pay attention to who we're talking about. So for people that that may be under some false understanding that there is no adversary. Right. There is no devil that he's made up. Well, OK, you, you take it up with scripture. Right. But it, it specifically says that they're talking about Beelzebub and it's another name for Satan. Also, they call him Prince. 
of evil spirits. Okay, so when you see that, so that is a that is a a, a number G nine five four. So if you want to go study that out, then I encourage you to look at that. There's some interesting things there. Also in Hebrew, right in the Old Testament, that you'll see uh, references of this Beelzebub. Okay, same 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 person, and they actually would call him Lord of the Fly, right? Or Lord of the Flies, and you may have seen that before. Okay, and and as far as definition, this is a Philistine deity that was worshipped at Ekron, right? So if you uh, have a, have time, I would encourage you to go through Second Kings chapter uh chapter number one there's a number of verses there to talk about this 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 beelzebub right so they're worshiping this so-called god of of uh of this of this philistine nation nation they are worshiping this god and now you have israel that's drawn off in temptation just like you know any other time you read in the bible is that they're tempted to actually worship this 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 uh this beelzebub and it's an interesting thing. The king is actually sending someone to go and, and, and pray to this king, of to this God of Ekron. And then God's response is, is there not a God in Israel? And it's amazing, right? So it's a powerful thing when you see this prophet is actually sent to actually stop this gentleman that's going to try to uh, ask of this God some some request that he has. And God's response and God's response or statement through this prophet is, is there not a God in Israel? And it's a powerful thing. And the reason why I wanted to make sure I could uh, can make a point of that is because it doesn't have to be this Beelzebub, right? It could be any idol that you're seeking a solution for that's above God, right? Don't forget, you are in a kingdom. So if you confess hope and faith in Jesus Christ, acknowledging that Jesus is your Lord, that means that, you're his, that he's your master. So how is it that we can seek a solution from anybody or anything else? And I know that for a truth for the body of Christ and you know a number of other people, but specifically talking about people that would consider themselves to be citizens of the kingdom of God, is that how is it that you can seek an astrology, right? And, and seek uh, divination, right? You can seek anything other than God for a solution to your problems. How is that, right? So it's a crazy thing. So another word is prince, okay? We will see that word prince. And the number for that is G758. Okay, you see that and you see the translation or the uh, the, the actual uh, Greek word there. I'm not going to try to pronounce it. I'm probably going to mess it up. Uh, but some words that they use to define that is uh, a ruler, right? This prince, when you see it, it could be ruler. It could be commander, right? It could be chief. It could be leader, okay? And these are some other ways that that Greek word is actually translated in, in, the, uh, in the New Testament. It is translated ruler. You see prince. OK, also, which is what we'll see this evening, chief magistrate, OK, or chief ruler. Right. These are very important things when we're when we're getting into what we're getting into tonight. So uh, I'm not sure if somebody would like to, but we'll, we'll go ahead and start with Mark chapter three, uh, verse number twenty three and go ahead and read through twenty nine. So anybody that would like to read that, you can. If you uh, don't you know, uh, want to do that, then I can go ahead and read it. But I want to give you an opportunity if somebody would like to read that. I, I got it. Okay. Uh, Mark 3 and 23. And he called them unto him and said unto them in parables, How can Satan cast out Satan? And if a kingdom be divided against itself, that kingdom cannot stand. And if a house be divided against itself, that house cannot stand. And if Satan rise up against himself and be divided, he cannot stand, but hath an end. No man can enter into a strong man's house and spoil his goods, except he will first bind the strong man, and then he will spoil his house. Verily I say unto you, all sins shall be forgiven unto the sons of men, and blasphemies wherewith soever they shall blaspheme. But he that shall blaspheme against the Holy Ghost has never forgiveness, but is in danger of eternal damnation. Good stuff. Thank you, Bridget. And we didn't read the few verses that's before that that kind of sets the stage for why he's making this statement and actually sharing this parable. Uh, do you mind giving us any background? You don't have to read if you want to read those verses, you can, but give us some background of what happened preceding uh, this parable and Jesus giving us this parable. Yep. 
Um, I think it was, I don't want to be wrong. I didn't read all of it, but is this the one where he was having a conversation with the Pharisees or Sadducees Pharisees? Um, because he was probably healing again on the Sabbath. And um, Nick, he was having a demon that he was doing these mighty works through. Sounds good. Anybody uh, that, that looked at the verses, you can go up a couple verses and look at that and see if Bridget's right about it. Or Bridget, Bridget, you can look at it and check yourself. I believe you're right, but you look at it and see. Is that is that is that correct? And are you still looking at it, uh, Bridget? Is that what you're doing? Yeah, I, th I thought you were asking other people. Yeah, um, I was. Says, you, you or anybody else. Yeah, verse 22. So um, he was healing and casting out unclean spirits. And verse 22 said, And the scribe which came down from Jerusalem said, He hath the elbow, and by the prince of devils casteth he out devils. Good stuff. And the interesting thing is you'll find in dealing with Jesus and parables. For one, Jesus normally and just in general, he is preaching with parables to the masses. OK, so that's the reason why I want to I want to make sure I emphasize that. Now, he, he has times when he does share parables with the disciples specifically. But in general, normally, if he's sharing a parable, it is to the masses. Now, even more strange when you see who he's talking to is that many times it's because these Sadducees and Pharisees and these religious leaders is that they are putting their, their foot in their mouths, right? Either, either they're saying something vocally, like outwardly with their mouth, or they're standing around in the midst of all these people and they're in their heart, they're thinking these things and Jesus is addressing the issues of their heart and he addresses that normally in parables, which is a powerful thing. Sometimes the parables, they didn't even understand. They just knew that the parable was about them. Right. They could know that there, there was about them. So they were ticked off, offended because they know that they knew what Jesus was talking about them, but wasn't really sure what he was saying. So there's another case. Right. Jesus is doing his business, doing his father's work. Right. Going about his father's business. And, and there you go. Meddling. Right. Coming about saying some stuff. And now they're going to get themselves tore up is what they got going on. So what we're doing is we're getting an opportunity to, to hear or read the parable that Jesus is actually saying in response to what they're either thinking in their heart, saying with their mouth, or a combination of the two. I hope that makes sense. So the first line that we see there is, is again, we looked at uh, this Beelzebub, also this word prince. OK, we see that. And the first line, it says, and he called them unto him and he said unto them in parables, how can Satan cast out Satan? Right. And that's a very, really good question when you stop and think about it. OK, so begin stepping back and getting out of a religious mindset understand we're talking about kingdoms okay so when it mentions this word prince right ruler commander treat chief commander now we're talking about a person of, of authority highest authority in that area or that region so if we want to look at it we can say how can a king put himself out of his own territory right so if we have caesar how would caesar put himself out of out of out of rome right that, that really wouldn't make sense. How would the Queen of England put herself out of, out of England? Does that make sense? Like, how would the chief person cast their self out? Like, that doesn't even make sense. So when we step back and understand kingdoms, we say, oh, that is ludicrous, right? So Jesus is saying, what you guys are talking about does not make sense because this is the chief prince, the chief ruler that is causing all of this foolishness, either him or one of his, his fallen angels, that are causing these problems. And now you're saying that I am under his power and I am casting him out by himself. Like he's like, dude, you, you, you tripping on that, right? That doesn't even make any sense. Okay. Anybody got any comments or, or anything on, on verse 23 before we move forward? And does that make sense? Why Jesus is saying that? Okay, then verse number 24, 
if a kingdom be divided against itself, that kingdom cannot stand. This is a powerful, powerful scripture. OK, anybody have any comments or questions or anything about that before before I say anything? What do you notice there about that? So as we're looking at it, just make sure that, again, if you're not saying anything, that's OK. You should be thinking because I'm telling you as a truth. OK, I'm just going to be very, very straightforward. Uh, many of the things that we're going to address tonight and say tonight, uh, you've never heard before. OK, and just because you've never heard it doesn't mean it's not true. I will confirm them in the word of God. Uh, but I know sometimes we go to some places and it seems like because you haven't heard someone else say it, that, that you believe validates the word of God then sometimes you don't really think that it is uh, something that you should you should believe. Right. And she's why I say prove it, test it. Right. Don't just reject it. Don't. I said this before. I got to say it before I move forward. Belief is not a test of truth. Listen to what I'm saying. I've said it before. But if I don't reiterate this, then what will happen is I'll make a statement. I'm going to tell you something that's the truth. And what's going to happen is going to be disregarded. It's going to be ignored and you're going to totally miss it. Now, what will happen is. You'll have somebody that's a person that you will appreciate and a person that you will uh, have respect for that will say the same exact thing. But because that person said it, you'll believe it. Right. And it's ridiculous because the spirit of God is the one who's teaching. So I'm telling you, these things are true. So if you don't believe it, that's OK. But don't say I don't believe it and don't go prove it out. Say, you know what? I don't see it that way. Or I don't believe it right now, but I'm willing to go prove it out. That's what I'm sharing with you, because these are very important things. OK, so with that being said, when we're looking at verse 24, this is a law. This is a, a if we we're talking about warfare, this is a law in dealing with kingdoms. So, again, in religion, it doesn't really make as much sense. But when you understand that there are kingdoms that have been rising and falling throughout the history of humanity, this is a law. This is a truth of warfare, how you deal with kingdoms. OK, and it says if a kingdom divided, divided against itself, that kingdom cannot stand. So how do you come against the kingdom? It doesn't it doesn't matter how big and powerful the kingdom is. How can you have victory over a kingdom? What does it say there in 24 that we see? How do you how do you have victory over a kingdom? What is the weapon that's used? And again, I'm talking about verse number 24. You said, well, what was the weapon? Yep. What is the weapon that's used against a kingdom? Because it's talking about a kingdom. What is the weapon that's being used against any kingdom? You said what? Itself. Okay. Be be more specific. Um, what do you mean yeah. itself? Division. division, discord within the kingdom. So the key is division. So pay attention to what's going on. Okay. Jesus, Jesus is he is sharing a truth that never it will never fail. He says, if you're dealing with a kingdom, if you can cause division within the kingdom, it will fall. He says it doesn't even make sense to believe that Beelzebub would try to cast out himself because he knows that if he does that, it's going to cause division and it's going to his kingdom is going to fall. Do you understand that? How do we know that that is a reality in dealing with the body of Christ? How do we know that this statement that Jesus made in verse number 24 is a reality? How do we know that that's true? Now, say that again. Uh, in verse number 24, uh, we, we mentioned that kingdoms are conquered or the weapon that's used against kingdom is the kingdoms is division. So I'm asking and dealing with the body of Christ, dealing with the church, the body of Christ. How do we know that that statement that Jesus made in verse number 24 is true? What proofs do we have? What evidence do we have that what he said is true? denominations absolutely right and what emerson said is denominations right think about it 
if you sit down and try to try to name every denomination, I don't think we can do it. Right now, these are all people that that confess hope and faith in Jesus Christ, saying that he is Lord, all supposed to be a part of the same kingdom. And yet still we have so much what division, so much what discord. Now, here's my question. That is what happened, right? You have all these denominations, all these different doctrines, all this discord and separation. What is the result of all the division? What is that done? What is that done in comparison to what kingdom that Jesus Christ brought? What is that done as far as what, what, where we're at right now in our, in our place and time and dealing with the body of Christ? What is that done? What is the result of that? Pose that question again. I'm sorry. I'm just asking. You mentioned the denominations, all the denominations, right? All the separation, division in the body of Christ. I asked, what is the result of that? Well, how has that infected or affected uh, the body of Christ? What is the result of that division? Well, there's so, I mean, it's numerous. Uh, I mean, where do you start? Number one, it introduced a lot of religion. Uh, it, it introduced a, a, a system that God never uh intended for us to be up under. Uh, it, it produced uh, uh, self-righteousness. Uh, it produces uh, hatred. Uh, it produces uh, high-mindedness. Uh, it produces, I think, everything that that, <laughs> that, that, is, that is God's kingdom is not about, really, uh, because he never had a denomination. So, yeah, it produces everything that God's kingdom is not about. Excellent. Anybody else? And this is not to go take a, uh, you know, a, 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 I guess a, I'm not trying to come against the, the body of Christ. So when I'm making these statements, if I can't have this conversation with my brothers and sisters in the kingdom, who can I have these conversations with? So when I ask Emerson that question, he says, where do I start? Right. So the reality is there are many things that we have accepted that we should have never accepted. These things have been in, they've been weapons, right? To cause division, planted seeds planted inside the church, and they have run rampant, right? All the gossiping that we become accustomed to, right? All the envy and strife that we become accustomed to, all the uh, legalism that we become become accustomed to, right? All the uh, vain, uh, uh, repetitious prayers that we do, right? All the long and loud prayers that we do standing. In, in open right all the good things that we do not in secret but in open to get a pat on the back for men right all these things that jesus is saying don't do is that those things and more that we see present in the body of christ yet still we act as if they're normal but what that does is 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 to make it very simple is to understand the purpose of it is to what divide us Right. It's a weapon, a tool to divide us. Why? Because if you're dealing with a kingdom, no matter how powerful this kingdom is, if you cause it to be divided and the people are not working together, then you neutralize this power. Does that make sense? OK, so when we're dealing with this, we can't bypass what Jesus is actually saying. OK, that's in 24. Anybody have a comment or a question or anything before we continue on? Well, yeah, and it also it also makes you uh, and and I know this is going to throw a lot of listeners off and a lot of people off, but it also makes you try to try to be a Christian. And in God's kingdom, there's no such thing as Christians. There's such thing as a citizen. So you're a citizen. You have to see. There's a different mindset you have to take. Oh, I am a citizen. I'm not a Christian. I'm a citizen, brother. Because you have to practice to to, to be a Christian. You want to practice to be a Christian. Listen, you can't practice to be a citizen. How many of you practice to be a citizen of the United States? <laughs> you don't. <laughs> you just are. And so there's a, there's, a, there's a major, major difference there. That's, I think, a different mindset to understand that I am a citizen of the kingdom of heaven and not a Christian. Boy, is that going to do something to somebody. Yeah, and that, that's, that's a rough statement, and I'm, I'm glad that you were bold enough to actually say that. I said that uh, some time ago, and I don't know if people really took me serious, uh, but it's a case where it's okay like to understand that, that you were not given uh, the thing that you may be holding, to, holding on to and holding precious, that you really were given a kingdom. So when we understand that that is what we've been given and that's what we are, then we start to, to try to come out from under some of the things 
that maybe have held us back. OK, so I'm not going to spend too much time with that. But what he's saying is, is, is just it's just on point. It's a reality. And he's telling you not just from uh, what he's heard. He's telling you from what he's known for him from himself and his own experience. And I'm not going to test to that because I, I've been right there with it. So what we want to do is just continue to just move on with this because it's a, a ton of uh, good stuff that we want to make sure we're just digging out. And it's just a wonderful thing to understand. Again, we miss that when we're not talking about kingdom stuff. We understand that in Rome, if you have an opportunity, I've said this before, but I'm not sure if you made the opportunity, make an opportunity to go and look at this Roman Empire, right? This great empire that pretty much conquered the, the most of the known world. And then what happened is, is that you have this kingdom of God that becomes present and it starts to infect Rome. And you see these pockets of people that begin to spread all throughout this Roman Empire and they don't know what to do, right? Why is this so dangerous? Because it causes division within, right? So Rome did not, uh, wasn't conquered by any other kingdom. So if you go and you look in, his, in the history books, you won't find another kingdom that actually just completely took over Rome, right? What happens is you find division that starts to take place. You have rulers that start to rise up. And this person takes this, this piece. This person takes that piece. This person that takes that piece. And then they have been segmented and division, divided over all over Rome. And then because they were weakened because of this division that happened on the inside of Rome, now it, it began to collapse. Right. So it's a powerful thing. Again, these, history proves what Jesus Christ said. So this is not something that Corey is saying. History proves this. Right. So when you look at it, you say, wow, you mean to tell me that, that, that the adversary understands kingdoms and he took the words of Jesus Christ at his word. Right. He took him at his word. He actually uses that as a weapon against the body and we don't even know it's being used against us absolutely he does it all the time right and and it's scary to understand that so why is that so important is if we continue to participate with the division now we're falling into what he's saying to do right so that's the reason why i say i can't go too harsh against the church and 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 so-called christianity I'm, i don't want to do that why because then it seems like we're trying to create a new thing right i'm not creating a new thing this is an old thing. It's the original thing. So it's the one mindedness. OK, that, that, that Jesus Christ is always talking about. Paul's talking about us having one mind, talks about this doctrine of Jesus Christ There's a reason why it's so important that Jesus Christ establishes the, the doctrine of God. And he wants us to be able to, to find that out, to walk in it, to, to really hold on to it. And he says, don't accept these other doctrines. If somebody comes knocking on your door, bringing another doctrine, a strange doctrine. He said, don't even don't even let them in your house. Right. He says, watch out for this, this leaven, right, that could enter in, which is these doctrines. He's, he's saying, watch out. The reason why is because this is the result that we find. We find that these things that we've seen have, have happened to the body. That's what happens. So it's not about trying to create division, but it's a case where if we don't have a, a real foundation, right, that we can establish ourselves on, which is what God has always given to us, is that sure, right foundation. Then we're going to try to build on something that God never gave us. OK, so again, just moving forward, just understand uh, if you haven't already made the time to make study, do a study. Uh, just just do it right. You, uh, this stuff just seems redundant and seems like I'm just making up stuff. If you haven't studied the kingdom of God, study the kingdom of heaven, study the kingdom itself all the way throughout the, the word of God. And just really it said, man, this is this is some this is some really interesting stuff that I should pay attention to. Right. So that's the reason why we're saying that. So let me just I don't want to hold too long there. I'm going to uh, read through some of these verses because we actually want to see this in at least a couple other places. OK, so in 25, it says, if a house be divided against itself, the house cannot stand. Right. Same same reality that, that he is uh, that he is establishing. And you can look at a household and you can see that there's no need in us really going to in too depth about that. You go into any household and if you can find. Uh, strife between sisters and brothers th there, there's no unity there if you see strife between the husband and wife there, there's there's no power there you see there's discord between the children and, and the and the parents right that the house is gonna fall that there, there's no threat but it, if they're able to actually unify with each other then that is a very dangerous household right so it's, a, it's a, just a reality that jesus is establishing there in 24 and in 25 and in 26 says and if Satan rise up against himself and be divided. He cannot stand, but hath an end. Pay attention to that. He said, 
hath an end. That would that is a final, right? That is the end of everything that he wants to do. He said, listen, the adversary is not going to do that because he knows that that would be his end if he actually stood against himself and allowed the vision that the adversary knows that that would be his end. Do you see that, 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 that definite statement? Okay. And then 27, no man can enter into a strong man's house and spoil his goods except he first bind the strong man and then he will spoil his house. Now I'm not going to linger there because it's, it's going to be in Matthew is going to Matthew's account is going to say the same thing, but keep that in mind. Verse number 27, ask yourself this before, if you know it, you can actually give a, you can give, be ready to, to actually comment. If you don't think about it, ask yourself, who is this strong man? Right? Who is this strong man? Okay. And what are the spoils? Right. What are these goods that spoil? OK. And, and, and where or what is the house? OK. These are some questions that you ask and, and, and really think, man, what are, who are these things? Because we're going to I want you to answer those. If you know it, you're going to give it. If you don't, then start asking yourself that question and ask the Holy Spirit, man, reveal to me who these who these characters are. What are these things? OK. But again, that's 27 and 28. It says, verily, I say unto you. All sins. This is crazy. OK. Understand. This is something that, again, Religious try religion tries to make up a whole bunch of stuff, but these are definite statements that come from the from the mouth of the king. He says, What all sins shall be forgiven. So for people that's in witchcraft and all kind of homosexuality and drug addiction, whatever it is that they've they, they've been into, the adversary will try to convince them that God doesn't want them anymore, that there's no forgiveness for that sin. He says, No, uh-uh. It doesn't matter how bad those things are. Listen to what it says: all sins shall be forgiven unto the sons of men and blasphemies wherewith soever they shall blaspheme right he says that pay attention here's the but 29 he that shall blaspheme against the holy ghost hath never forgiveness but is in danger of eternal damnation he's so that's like whoa right so you can do all kinds of crazy stuff but when it comes to dealing with the holy spirit and you willfully are blaspheming the Holy Spirit, he says that there is no forgiveness for that. Isn't that a scary thing? Okay. So again, we'll see that again. Can anybody tell me where else this, this parable is in Matthew? Can anybody find out where, where that account is in Matthew and go ahead and give us the, the address for that so we can read that? And again, this is in Matthew. Same account. It's in Matthew. Almost verbatim in Matthew. I'll give you a couple moments to see if you can find it. You can put it in the chat box or you can unmute yourself and give us those verses. And I hope that you're looking. I'm going to give you uh, 30 seconds. And if you, uh, you can get, uh, Google's fine. <laughs> So I Google sometimes when I'm looking for uh, for addresses that I that I can't find. If I know what it's saying, uh, then I'll, I'll just Google it and I'll be able to find the address. But I'm looking for this same parable in in Matthew. Got 15 seconds. Matthew 12 and 31. Okay, you said Matthew 12 and 31. And Bridget, are you able to, to actually read uh, Matthew? I actually started in, in verse number 22. Can you read Matthew uh, 12, beginning in verse number 22? Yeah. Uh, then was brought unto okay. him one possessed with the devil, blind and dumb, and he healed them. And so much the blind and dumb both spake and saw. And all the people were amazed and said, Is not this the son of David? But when the Pharisees heard it, they said, this fellow does cast out devils by the elbow of the prince of the devil. And Jesus knew their thoughts and said unto them, Every kingdom divided against itself is brought to desolation, and every city or house divided against itself shall not stand. And if Satan cast out Satan, he is divided against himself. And shall or how shall then his kingdom stand? And if I by the elbow cast out devils, by whom do your children cast them out. Therefore, they shall be your judges. But if I cast out devils by the Spirit of God, then the kingdom of God is coming to you. 
or else how can one enter into a strong man's house and spoil his goods, except he first bind the strong man, and then he will spoil his house. He that is not with me is against me, and he that gathereth not with me scattereth abroad. Wherefore, I say unto you, all manner of sin and blasphemy shall be forgiven unto men, but the blasphemy against the Holy Spirit, or I'm sorry, the Holy Ghost, shall not be forgiven unto men. Can you read 32 also? Yep, 32. And whosoever spaketh a word against the Son of Man, it shall be forgiven him. But whosoever speaketh against the Holy Ghost, it shall not be forgiven him, neither in this world, neither in the world to come. Awesome. Awesome. So what I'd like to do is just just open this up a little bit uh, to give take a couple seconds if you need to. And you can look back at uh, at Mark's account in Mark chapter three, if you like to and do a comparison to what you see here in Matthew. Or if you can just remember and you're looking at this and, and take notice of something that you see that sticks out, maybe something that's different or something that you say, man, that's that's something I, I never really paid attention to before. Or it's just something you paid attention to. You like to share but I like to make sure I give you some uh, some time to actually share some things that you actually notice uh, as you're reading through this this body of scripture, this parable that Jesus is actually uh, actually uh, preaching, and some things that he's actually saying. I like to be able to uh, to open this up so you can say something if you like. Um, like you say all the time, the, the word of God is not redundant. So I think it's neat how in verse 31, he says, um, blasphemy against the Holy, Holy Ghost shall not be forgiven unto man. And then he goes back and says it again, just to make sure you know, but who, whosoever speaketh against the Holy Ghost, it shall not be forgiven. Like he's not wasting his words. But he's definitely driving the point home. Awesome. Thank you for sharing. Again, it's not redundancy, it's consistency. So if nothing else, it's like the court of law. Uh, if you if you can think about it again, standing in the courtroom, uh, now you have multiple witnesses that will show up against you. So Jesus says that that he did not come to judge the world. He said he came to save the world. Right. But he also said that the word that he speaks will judge them in the end. Right. So it's a case where if you show up to court and you got five or six witnesses that standing against you, that's going to be a problem. Right. So if Jesus just mentioned it one time or, you know, you can have a scripture reference just once. You can kind of say you missed that. But you'll see that this is this is uh, actually two of, of, of three. <laughs> right. We've seen it once, <laughs> seen it twice. And then we're actually going to see it at least a third time. So it's a death. So, so it's at least three witnesses that that individual will have against them. And that's a scary thing. He's saying, hey, I want you to understand. I love you. I care about you. I came to save you. But but there are some things that you must understand. You can blaspheme me. Say all types of crazy things about me. And this is the king. You can do that. He says you can blaspheme God, the father who sits on the throne in heaven. You can do that. He says, but I'm telling you this. There is something that you can do that there will be no forgiveness for. And that that is a stark warning for anybody that's dealing with, again, kingdoms. <laughs> if you understand exactly what's going on, it's like, wow, man, why is it that he would allow someone to blaspheme himself and God the Father, but not the Holy Spirit, right? So thank you for pointing that out, Jesus. I mean, <laughs> Jesus, thank you for pointing that out, Bridget. Uh, anybody uh, want to say anything else, either in, in a response to what Bridget said or just anything that you'd like to share? Yeah, I think uh, I think it should be uh, answered. Why? Why? Like you said, why? Why? Why is that? Uh, can can we answer that? Can we give an answer to to why that is? Uh, that you can bless through Him, but you but if you bless through the Holy Spirit, then there is no uh, forgiveness for that. Can we have an answer for that? Uh, a great question. I would like for somebody else to 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 give a response before I before I think about trying to re respond to that. Emerson, do you have something? I know Pastor Mark will be jumping off of here in just a moment, uh, but he's here now. Maybe he's able to to give a response to that. Uh, I'd like to hear from somebody else. Why is that? 
I actually was, as we were talking through that, I, I settled in, you know, first Corinthians 12. It says that no man's speaking by the Holy Ghost, or the spirit of God calls it, calls Jesus accursed. And then in the heels of that, it says no one can say that Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Ghost. So if the, if the Holy Ghost, if he is discredited, then there is no way uh, to say that Jesus is Lord. And if you cannot say that Jesus is Lord, then you cannot be forgiven. You can't be saved. Uh, and it's the Holy Spirit who convicts, convinces, as Jesus taught in St. John 16, he will come, he will convict of sin, of righteousness, and of judgment. He won't speak of himself, but he'll, he'll speak of me. And so the Holy Spirit has been called the governor of the kingdom. And, you know, he has a vital uh, uh, role, and that role is to reveal uh, the Lord Jesus. And if, again, if he is quenched, resisted, discredited, uh, blasphemed, then he cannot be heard. And therefore, one's heart cannot be convinced or convicted to say that Jesus is Lord. Amen. That's just uh, awesome. Thank you so much, Pastor Burroughs. Emerson, did you have uh, something that you were going to say either in response to what Pastor Burroughs said or something that you'd like to add or Bridget? No, just want to piggyback on what uh, uh, Pastor Mark just said about the Holy Spirit being the governor. And, and, and oftentimes we, we confuse that, him being the governor of the kingdom, but the governors like we have here in our democratic uh, society. That's not the case. Because him him, him being the governor, was, it was not like anybody elected. God appointed him there. We elect governors here. So don't mix up the two. That means he is the mouthpiece of God. He speaks directly. This is what the Father says. This is what the Father says. This is what he, he here to do, pronounce exactly what God has said. And so, yes, yeah, Pastor Mark said, with, without you, <laughs> you, you blessing him, you, how are you going to, how are you going to understand or hear what God says? You can't do anything without, without the Holy Spirit. So don't confuse the two, them being the governor of the kingdom with the governors that we look at here on. Uh, on uh, in the United States and, and Earth, where we vote them in, the, and this is not voted in, and so we don't really have a say so in that. God appointed him, so that that's all I have. Awesome stuff. Thank you so much, Emerson. I, I, I want to say, man, y'all got me sound like Ric Flair over here, man. I'm like, woo, <laughs> y'all on fire, boy. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, man, that's awesome. Did you have any comment uh, about that line there or any question that you had? No, I'm just glad that it was answered because it, it makes so much sense, you know. And like uh, what Emerson said, being the mouthpiece of God, man, that's that's crazy, man. But I, that, but I understand now, what, you know, why it would be that way. Good stuff. Good stuff. Thank you. Thank you, Pastor Burroughs, for, for sharing that. Uh, and I, I appreciate it. Uh, so when we're dealing with that, here's the thing. Again, we're talking kingdom. So it, it helps us to be able to understand why this thing is so important. So I'll give uh, an example biblically. OK, if you look at the way that uh, the I guess the government was set up when Jesus was there, then you'll see uh, Herod. OK, and it, it talks about the Herodians. OK, these different people that are in, in this line of, of Herod's. And that Herod, again, was a pseudo king. OK, they wanted to be looked at as king, but really they didn't have that much power. OK, but why? Because when you start looking at the hierarchy, you're like, man, I mean, why would you <laughs> be so excited about being a Herod when you really didn't have that much power? So you have this so-called pseudo king of Jerusalem, which would be the Herod. And I think I mentioned this last week, but then you also have these uh, this this uh, ruling a legal body, which is the council or the Sanhedrin, right? It's a combination of Pharisees, Sadducees, scribes, um, uh, high priests, right? All these combination of people that make up this, this Sanhedrin. And these are the legal body. So if a person was uh, brought into this courtroom like Jesus were, that's the reason why they tried to, you know, uh, bring false charges against Jesus. They were looking for him to say something that they knew would violate the law. So they had a reason to crucify him or, or have him killed. So the thing is, they couldn't kill him, but all, all they could do is because he was guilty of that, now you send them higher, right? So they didn't take him to Herod. 
right? So the, the, the Sadducees, the Pharisees, they ruled against Jesus and who they had to send him to, right? They had to send him to the governor, right? So that's the reason why Pilate is so important. So when we're looking at the way that these legal you know, uh, uh, positions are put in place, then you understand, the, again, why are these kingdom, this kingdom thing so important? So Pilate, he says, hey, I'm asking you, are you a king? Jesus is responding in ways that he's like, I, I need you to be very direct because I don't think that you're actually guilty and I don't want your blood on my hands. Can you be very direct with me? So Jesus is letting him know in many ways, hey, you don't have any power other than what's given to you. If I really wanted to, I could call down angels, legions of angels, and they, they will they will make sure that that nobody exists after after they're after they're done with this place. But it's this this is not about me as far as the way that that's going down. My kingdom is not of this place. He says, so my kingdom is of heaven. So he's establishing these truths, but understand what's going on with Pilate. Pilate is the one who actually has the power from the Roman government in Jerusalem. Pay attention. OK, he's the one that's responsible for the culture of Rome being established in Jerusalem. Listen, he's the one that has the power to say a person can live or die. He's responsible for, again, the culture being established. He's responsible for all of these things actually happening. That is his responsibility. So when we're dealing with the Holy Spirit, understand that if you biblically look at it, nothing really is happening in the earth without the Holy Spirit. You can go back to the book of Genesis chapter number one, and it talks about the spirit that is hovering, right? There's darkness that exists, but nothing's happening until what happens? Until God actually speaks. So when God speaks a word, when this word is actually proclaimed, the rhema is proclaimed, now who goes to work? You got it. The governor, right? <laughs> The, the, the Holy Spirit is now able to actually respond or go to work on the word that was actually spoken. It was, it's the tools. It's the material that he uses to bring about the will of God. So understand the importance of this great Holy Spirit is that he is doing that throughout the earth. He's done that throughout history. All these great miracles, all these great things is happening. Now the kingdom of God has actually been returned. Right. It's been returned through Jesus Christ. And before I say it's been returned, before it actually left. When, when Adam was charged to take care of, to subdue and to, to have dominion over the earth, he's doing words, right? It's not with his physical hands. He is the spirit being in a dirt body with the soul and he is speaking words. Why? Because the spirit of God and the host of God is responsible for carrying out the words that are spoken. This is crazy stuff. So when this kingdom is, is brought back through the last Adam, which is Jesus Christ, now what happens is he is establishing what? God, your kingdom come, right? When we looked at the Lord's prayer and it says, first of all, Father, I acknowledge that you are in heaven, right? That you are holy, you're separate. I acknowledge that you are our father. We are drawn out of you and that you're in heaven. But then what's the first thing that we petition for? Your kingdom come. Isn't that crazy? We petition for the kingdom to come first so that God's will can be done in, as a, in response to the kingdom coming. So what you'll find is, is that you will not find the presence of the kingdom without the Holy Spirit. Not going to happen, right? So that they're, 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 they're so joined and so close is that the presence of the kingdom of God, it brings the Holy Ghost. Why? Because he's responsible for making sure that everything that has been established in heaven, the culture, the will, everything in heaven, heaven, his responsibility is to make sure that it manifests in you. Right. Because the kingdom of God, according to what is that, Luke 17, 20 and 21 is within you. So his responsibility is as that kingdom comes. Now we rely on him to unpack the culture of heaven in us. Isn't that crazy? So if you mess around and you're going to blaspheme the governor, the person that's in charge to doing everything, you ain't got no hope. <laughs> so what Pastor Mark said is incredible. Like, that's that's incredible. You can't confess hope and faith in Jesus Christ without the Holy Spirit. But nothing is done by God without the Holy Spirit. It ain't done. Nothing is going to be established from heaven and be manifest in earth without the holy spirit like this is how powerful 
the Holy Spirit is. So when Jesus is establishing it, understand this is a kingdom reality. And a lot of people don't understand how powerful that is. So we don't allow the spirit of God to work. Right. We don't allow him to move. He is the dudamus. He is the power. Right. So if we don't allow him to do anything. That's the reason why there's void of power. In churches, void of power in the body of Christ, void of power in our lives, because we're not yielding ourselves to the governor. We're not yielding ourselves to the Holy Spirit to allow him to do the work. Jesus Christ, he has gone back to the right hand of the father. Right. He is not on earth right now. If we want to say that he's living in us, we can say that. But as far as Jesus, the Christ it says that he ascended to heaven, back to the right hand of the father. God, the father is on the throne, doesn't leave the throne. So who's responsible for doing the work on earth? You got it. The Holy Spirit. Right. So he's, he's looking to work through you, work through me to, in order to establish the will of God on the earth. So it's just a powerful thing. So hope that was uh, helpful. Hope that hope that uh, uh, helped at all. Any comments, any questions before we before we move on to the, the next place that this uh, this uh, parable is actually seen? Any comments, any questions? All right. This is good stuff. Uh, anybody want to tell us where the third place is that this parable is actually mentioned? Anybody got the third place? I hope you didn't see it. <laughs> it's, a, it's another place. One last place. And I'll give uh, 30 seconds if you want to try to look and see if you can find out where this where this parable is mentioned the third time. And again, we have uh, we began with Mark chapter three. Uh, we just looked at Matthew chapter 12 and it's mentioned in another gospel and one more gospel. Where is that mentioned at? You got 15 seconds if you want to try to give a shot of what where 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 that's at. All right, three, two, one. All right. So go to Luke chapter eleven. Okay. And we're gonna read. Luke chapter 11, verses 14 through 26. Now, here's the thing is wonderful. And it reminds me uh, of the parable of the sower in many ways. I love it when we can get at least uh, two to three accounts for, for something that's actually said by Jesus, because it almost always gives us a little nugget, a little something that we didn't get in the other places. And it's, it's no different in this account is that you'll see that uh, Luke and Mark, they were very similar. It was a couple subtle words that was different. But then in Luke's account, it's like, wow, he, he you, you are, you're given some more information that I know is not happening since an accidental. So we don't want to ignore it. So let's let's look at uh, Luke again, Luke chapter 11, beginning in verse number 14. I'm going to read this. And it says. And he was casting out a devil and it was dumb. And it came to pass when the devil was gone out, the dumb spake and the people wondered. But some of them said he casteth out devils through Beelzebub, the chief of the devils and others tempting him, sought of him a sign from heaven. But he, knowing their thoughts, said unto them, every kingdom divided against itself is brought to desolation. And a house divided against a house falleth. If Satan also be divided against himself, how shall his kingdom stand? Because ye say that I cast out devils through Beelzebub. And if I by Beelzebub cast out devils, by whom do your sons cast them out? Therefore shall they be your judges. But if I with the finger of God cast out devils no doubt the kingdom of god is come upon you so we just saw that last week right and you can see how the presence of the holy spirit and the kingdom of god they're right there united so again in 20 it says but if i with the finger of god cast out devils no doubt the kingdom of god is come upon you when a strong man armed keepeth his palace his goods are in peace but when a stronger man or stronger than he shall come upon him and overcome him, he taketh from him all his armor wherein he trusted and divideth his spoil. He that is not with me is against me, and he that gathereth not with me scattereth. 
when the unclean spirit is gone out of a man, he walketh through through dry places, seeking rest and findeth none. He saith, I will return unto my house whence I came out. And when he cometh, he findeth it swept and garnished. Then goeth he and taketh to him seven other spirits more wicked than himself. And they enter in and dwell there. And the last state of the man is worse than the first. OK, so we're going to go back up to the to the beginning of this. And then I want to make sure that you're I'm opening this up so you can share whatever you like to share. But the first thing I like to make sure that we, we see is in. Uh, 17. OK, when I say that Jesus Christ is sometimes addressing things that people didn't say, pay attention there. It didn't say that they it didn't say that they said anything with their mouth. Because Jesus Christ is able to, to know a man's heart, right? He's able to read a man's heart. He knows a man's heart. He is actually able to see what they're saying without them speaking verbally. So he's addressing and rebuking them, not for what they said verbally. Isn't that crazy? He's actually saying, he's, he's addressing what they thought about. This is a powerful man. This is just powerful, right? Powerful stuff. He says, knowing their thoughts, okay? And another one that I'd like for you to take a note of, it says, Going down there at uh, 19, and it says, and if by Beelzebub cast out de de devils, by whom do your sons cast them out? And it says this is the truth. He says, therefore, shall they be your judges? OK, so understand we have these Sadducees, Pharisees, scribes, these ruling you know, people and, and they themselves. OK, they were not accepting Jesus Christ. OK, if they if they believed, then they wouldn't actually confess. There's a scripture that actually talked about that in John said that many of them believed, but they, they didn't confess that Jesus Christ was Lord because they said that they, they sought the, uh, the respect and honor of men above God, right? So they, 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 they viewed that as higher than God, so they didn't actually say it, but they believed it in their heart. So even if these people did believe, then they didn't actually show it. But here's the reality. He says that your sons, okay, your, your, your sons and daughters. So this is a reality is that some of their sons and daughters actually confessed hope and faith in Jesus Christ and they were able to cast out devils, right? That's a crazy stuff. So when, when, when that reality is established, he says, okay, you chose not to go in, right? So you're standing in the way for people just trying to go into the kingdom of heaven. You don't want to let them go into the kingdom of heaven. And you won't go in yourself. He says that even your children are going to be in judgment of you. Right. So you won't go in. So your children are going to judge you. Isn't that crazy stuff? OK, so I'm going to pause there. Any comments, any questions, anything, not just about what I said, but just looking at this scripture, things that, that jump out to you that you like to, to, to share something about or ask a question about. All right. Well, I hope you're following along with me again. I've never heard anybody address that before. It doesn't mean they didn't. Uh, but I'm just saying uh, that these are very important things that Jesus is saying it. He doesn't waste any words. OK, uh, so just 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 continuing to go down. Then what I'd like to do is to just point out uh, verse number 20, 21. And it says, when a strong man armed keepeth his palace. Now, this is very important, OK, because it talks about this strong man. And in this one, it doesn't say this in the other two, but it talks about this strong man. It says that he is armed and it says he is keeping his palace and he says that his goods are in peace. So there's a couple of things that are present. We have the palace. We have this armed strong man. OK, it means he is, has some type of of armed. Right. He's armed with something. Right. I don't know what it is, but it says he's armed with something in order to defend his goods. And then there's goods. So what are his goods? Right. And that's a, it's a, it's a really powerful thing. It says, it says there in 22, but when a stronger than he shall come upon him and overcome him, he taketh from him all his what armor wherein he trusteth and he divideth his spoils. So anybody have any, any, anything about that, uh, that, that you, that you'd like to share a question, maybe that you, that you see, or, or, or something you'd like to share about what you believe that that's actually alluding to. Anything there?
Okay. And Bridget actually gave us Luke 12 and 10. Uh, I, I, I just saw that she actually put that in the chat box. I do want to say that. So here's what I like to, to pull out. So I'll make sure that I say this. And there's some scriptures that will that will re, you know, reinforce that, prove it out. OK, so again, I'm going to share it. I'm just going to be, be totally transparent with you. So pay attention to what I'm saying. So Jesus is tell, telling us the reality of what goes on inside of a human body. Pay attention to what I'm saying. OK, so again, when we're dealing with Jesus Christ, obviously he created everything. So he knows the inner workings of everything. So when he's saying things, we need to make sure that we listen. You are a spirit being in a dirt body with a soul. So here's the reality is that you have a demonic force that is actually trespassing against a human being and to a point where he is calling that human body or spirit. He is right, because we see that at the end of the parables, it says my house. He says he's going to return back to my house. So when we have people that sometimes are talking to themselves and doing some things that we don't think is OK, uh, that just have a lot of whatever they got going on mentally. Many times they are possessed by a demon. Right. There's no pills that's going to fix that. Ain't no counselor going to fix that. Right. That is supposed to be cast out by someone that has the authority to cast that out. OK, so pay attention to what's going on. So you have the presence of the demonic force and it says specifically the strong man. Right. So not just any devil. This is either uh, the adversary himself, the devil himself that has possessed someone or it's another ruling spirit. OK, that has inhabited this person. So here's the thing is, is, is very interesting. It mentions specifically that that he has this armor. Right. Or he has these 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 weapons, this armor that he is entrusting in to be able to, to, to keep a hold of this palace, right? And he's trying to keep his goods. So here's the thing that's very interesting, okay, is that what you have is, is that when you have a demonic force that comes in, usually what comes allows them to come in is some sort of offense. So pay attention to what I'm saying. This is the same way with people that are uh, possessed with demons or oppressed by demons. So just because a person is not uh have a doesn't have a, a demonic forces living within them doesn't mean you can't be oppressed right thoughts that keep coming in your mind it seems like you're being harassed by these demons right all these types of things right a person could be possessed or they could be uh oppressed okay by these demonic forces pay attention to what i'm saying is that usually what happens is is that the offense it it, it becomes what's called like armor this this devil has to have some type of experience that this person is holding on to. And now he's able to actually hide himself and use it as a defense to be able to hold up on the inside of the person. Right. So every time somebody comes along and says that God loves you, that person is automatically by default going to go back, going to go back to the offense that happened. Right. It could be abuse, sexual abuse. It could be some type of uh, uh, it, uh, being uh, ignored by a family member, a mom, a dad or grandparent. Right. It could be, uh, again, uh, more more specifically, uh, sexual abuse that happens to kids. Right. It could be a, a multitude of different things that happen. And because that event happens now, the event is is a real thing. Right. No one can take take that real thing away. It's a real thing. And now it's a false idea that was attached to that. So now every time somebody tries to, to come against that idea, that person reinforces the idea that the reason why I was sexually abused is because of this. The reason why they, they threw me aside and discarded me is because of this. The reason why that happened is because of this. Right. So it's all lies. So this this demonic force is actually able to hold up and use that as like an armor or a weapon to be able to keep his position inside the, inside the person. I hope that makes sense. OK, so it, it, it's calling this palace or this house. It's calling that either the, the person, the physical body, the soul or the spirit, but it's the inside of the person is calling this house or the, or the palace. And then you have, again, these goods. OK, the armor is the offense. The goods is what it is that the demon has taken away from the person. Pay attention to what I'm saying. So usually what happens is when you have these demonic forces, there's the presence of sickness, the presence of disease. Right. So that person has their health that's been removed from them, right? There's a there, there's a person who does not have any peace. They can't hardly sleep, right? They can't have any peace. They have thoughts to torment them all the time, right? So now what happens is the demonic force has taken what? As a good, taken their peace from them. 
right? This person lives in poverty. It seems like nothing goes right for them. Everything always falls. The bottom falls out of everything that they do. Now this, this, uh, this demonic force is taking their provision away from them, right? There's a multitude of things, but these are things that a person rightfully has, has a right to, right? These goods, the person has a right to, and because the demonic force has come in, now he has taken that away from the person. That person has no right to those things, and he's holding them and said, these are, these are my goods. The demon is saying, these are my goods. That piece, your piece is now no longer yours, it's mine. Your resources are not yours, it's mine. Your health is no longer yours, it's mine, right? So he's holding on to it. So powerful things, so pay attention. The stronger man is the Holy Spirit. He's the Holy Ghost. The stronger man comes in, the Holy Spirit comes in, and it says that he binds, right? And it's the two scriptures you can look at in Matthew 16 and 18 and Matthew 18 and 18. Again, Matthew 16, 18 and Matthew 18, 18 talks about uh, us being given the keys of the kingdom, right? And it says that whatsoever you bind in heaven shall be bound in earth and whatsoever you loose in heaven shall be loosed on earth. Pay attention. This power of binding or tying up or locking up has been given to citizens of the kingdom of God, right? How was that? How was that happen? It's because of this finger of God, which is the Holy Spirit, which is a strong man, which is doing the work, right? So he's giving it. God, Jesus Christ has given you the authority, which is the presence, right, of this renewed spirit, the reality that you are a renewed spirit being, that is your authority. You have the authority. He's transferred the right of authority to you. And this power, which is the dunamis of God, the Holy Spirit is in you. And he is responsible for doing the work. So he is the finger of God. He is the one that's responsible, responsible for actually doing the binding of the strong man. I hope that makes sense, right? This is a powerful, powerful scripture when we start to break it down and say, my goodness, these things are, 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 are very important, right? So even if you're to the point where in 21, it says in peace, right? How does he have peace? That's one of the things that he's taking. <laughs> so the demon is in peace because he took the person's peace, right? It's crazy stuff. Okay, so I'm going to pause right there. I don't want to go any deeper with that. But understand how these things work. This is getting into kingdom business, right? The adversary has these, these demonic forces or he himself thinks he has the right to be able to trespass a, in a, in, into a person, to take possession of the person, call that person his palace or his house and take their, their, their peace, their health, take whatever it is as his goods and hold on to him, right? He thinks he has the power to actually do that. And we are relying on the stronger man, right? And again, Emerson and Pastor Mark alluded to him being the governor, right, to come in, being the stronger man to actually take control of that situation, to bind that strong man, that devil, and to be able to spoil him, right? So when you look at spoil, understand the spoil is taking what someone has of precious, of, of precious uh, possessions that they have, and you take them away and you, you make them your own. So what the what what the the stronger man the Holy Spirit does he takes that peace he takes that joy he takes that 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 uh, that health right takes the provision he takes all those things that have been taken from that person and he gives it back to the person isn't that awesome so he spoils them right takes it from the from the adversary rips it from him and then gives it back uh, to the to the person who it was taken from this is just awesome stuff okay any comments any questions anything about what I'm saying I pray that 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 you are following along with me. If, if you don't have anything, if you can at least just say, I, I'm here, I'm hearing you, I'm still on here, uh, just give me some kind of feedback before I move forward, please. Good stuff. Yeah, very, very good stuff, man. Very good stuff. Okay, good stuff. Awesome. Does, does it make sense what I'm what I'm sharing about how, how that works out and what I'm looking at in that scripture? Does that make sense? Absolutely. Absolutely. I'm loving it. Okay, good stuff. Thank you so much for that feedback. All right. So and, and moving on, just just to make sure, OK, that's what I'm I'm pointing out in, in that part of the verse. Is there anything else that you notice that you'd like to point out or you have a question about? And, and as, as far as uh, in, in looking at this account in uh, in Luke. OK, well, I'm going to make a one one last comment in that and then I'm going to give some verses. Just read those and we'll be done for tonight. And I want to make sure if you hear anything uh, or have a question or whatever it is, make sure you unmute yourself or put something in the chat box 
But I'm going to pick up here in 24. This is just outstanding stuff when we see what Jesus Christ is actually a, is revealing. Understand this. Pay attention to what I'm saying. You won't know God unless he reveals himself. That's the reason why religious religion is stupid. And I, I hate to say it that way, because it can believe or lead a person to believe that they can know God who is unsearchable and unknowable outside of what he has actually revealed about himself. That's the reason why we come to wrong conclusions, right? So the reality is we only know because he reveals himself to us. He also created us. So we don't even know ourselves outside of what he is telling us or revealing to us about us, right? So if we're trying to go and, and, and so-called have self-discovery and find ourselves outside of the word of God, outside of God, then we always gonna come up with messed up conclusions, right? So understand that we know God because of what he has revealed about himself. And we know ourselves because what he has revealed about us to us. We also know how things work, how things are governed spiritually and naturally based on the laws that he put in place. And he reveals that we won't know those things unless he reveals them. So he's telling us. So Jesus Christ is sharing something that we will not know unless he tells us this. So look at 24. He says, this is what's happened. So when this devil gets cast out, pay attention. <laughs> he says that when the unclean spirit is gone out of a man, it says he walks through dry places. He is looking for what? Rest, seeking rest, and he's finding none. He said, I will return unto my house, <laughs> right? My house. Brother, he's talking about somebody's body, man. He says, my house. He says, that is my house, okay? Whence I came out, and when he cometh, he findeth it swept and garnished. How was it swept and garnished? How did it get clean? Right? Then goeth he and taketh to him seven other spirits more wicked than himself, and they enter in and dwell there. And what happens? He says, and the last state of that man is worse than the first. Okay? Anybody have a comment or a question or anything that you notice there? Uh, in verses 24, 25, and 26. Anything, anybody. And I'll give you about uh, maybe 10 more seconds. I know you might probably are thinking, maybe pondering about you know what you see. Give you about 10 more seconds. All right. So I'm picking up in 24. Uh, here's the reality is that. We saw a scripture that talks about uh, a wine skin who who takes new wine and pours it into old wine skin. Right. Who takes a, a, a new fabric, a piece of fabric and puts it onto an old garment. Right. Who does that? It doesn't make any sense. So what has to happen is, is that this this wine skin has to be made new in preparation for the new wine. Right. We You remember those verses. So here's the reality is that when a person has a demon or demonic force that's cast out of that person, the Holy Spirit is actually sweeping and garnishing that place, makes it clean. Right. Makes it like nothing was ever there before. Now, here's the challenge. The challenge is, is that person's heart has not been changed. They themselves as a, as a spirit being has not been made new. Now, this is crazy stuff. But Jesus is telling us this is the way it goes on. So for that individual, even though they themselves have been swept clean and been garnished, he says that that demonic spirit, he's going to go out because he can't find rest. So pay attention to that. The reason why it's so important for that demonic force to have presence inside of that person is because they're looking for rest. He says that the reason why they're causing havoc and trying to get into a person is because they want rest. It mentions that early on. He says peace. Right. He says so that he so they can have peace. So he wants peace. He wants rest. It only comes when he is possessing someone. So the reality is the person has not confessed hope and faith in Jesus Christ, been reborn. Then that house has been swept and garnished, but the house has not been made new, which means that the Holy Spirit does not have the right and authority to dwell and remain in that person. Even though the presence of the finger of God and the kingdom of the kingdom of God has come on that person, it cannot remain unless the person is made brand new. So it says that when that devil goes out, he goes through dry places seeking rest. And what he's going to do is after he has not been able to find any rest, he's going to go find other demonic forces that are worse than himself. 
crazy, man, where you had one devil, now you got seven or eight devils, right? And now those devils are going to come in. It says the state of that person is even worse than it was before, right? How do we know that? You can look at the, de uh, the demoniac. When Jesus is coming out of the boat, he steps on the shore, and then it's just it's these gentlemen, this gentleman or these gentlemen, depending on what account that you're reading, he says that they've been chained with fetters, right? No man knows what to do with them because they keep breaking the chains. They're cutting themselves, doing all kind of crazy stuff. And then th this, this demon speaks and it says that he has legions. He says, my name is Legion because there are so many devils in me. That was the, uh, the result of, of what happens to, to, to a person where these multiple demons come out. Uh, Mary Magdalene is another example. It says, that she, I think she's, they says she has seven demons, I believe, that came out of her. Scary to think about. Bad enough to have one. But these are cases where you have legions, thousands of angels, I mean, of devils or, 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 or multiple devils that can actually reside on the inside of a person. So when you see people doing crazy stuff, understand that there's a reason why. That's the reason why you don't laugh at them and try to make jokes or anything like that, because that's that's the presence of the Holy Ghost and the presence of the, the, the kingdom of God on the earth. That's the value of it, because it's your job. It's my job to be able to, if the person will allow, is to send the devil packing. <laughs> Tell them, look, you've been held up in this person too long. You got to go. Come out and return no more, right? That's our responsibility is not to send them to uh, the insane asylum, right? It's not to send them to the mental ward. It's not to go put them on all kinds of prescriptions where they can't see and think straight and, and be capable of functioning as a human, a human being anymore. It's supposed to be the, the, the kingdom of God coming upon these people to release them and give them their rights back. I hope that made sense. Any comments, any questions, anything before I read uh, the scriptures that I have here? Anything that you'd like to share? Yeah, I'd like to share something real quick. All right. Um, yeah, I was a, a atheist for 16 years. And uh, just one day out of the blue, uh, God revealed himself back to me and I became a believer again. But it seemed like at that time, being fresh into being a believer, I've always dealt with depression and, and anxiety, but it seemed like it got worse. Um, I got addicted to drugs hard, but it wasn't until I received the baptism of the Holy Spirit that I was able to like, like basically what you're saying, for, have that demon removed, those demons removed. It wasn't until then that I was able to remove them. So what you're talking about I totally, I, I lived, I, I have lived that. I lived that. Thank you so much uh, for being willing to, to share that. And with your experience, Lionel, then that's just a proof that there are numbers of people. I don't know how many people that, that could possibly listen to this, this message uh, or whatever it is. They're just all over the place looking for peace looking for freedom, looking for the things that, that you said that you actually were able to find. They, they weren't able to find that. So I appreciate you sharing. Any, anything else that you want to share? All right. Did you have anything else you wanted to share, Lionel? Oh, I'm sorry. I, I was trying to find the, the button. Um, no, not really. Not really. I'm, I'm just really enjoying um, what you're saying, man, because it really touches home. And uh, I hope this recording touches a lot of people, man, like it has with me. Amen. Amen. And that's the reason why we do this. Again, this is not a uh, reason why I say it's not a Bible study. I'm done with calling it the Bible study. Uh, it's not just a meet to meet. OK, it's not just me sitting around just trying to show you things that I've learned and you say, ooh, and ah, uh, you know, any of that is not not about any of that. I am in, in functioning in a role as an ambassador. That's the reality of it. Right. I'm an ambassador of the kingdom. That's that's my role. When when God shared with me that I'm supposed to help you assimilate into the kingdom of God, I had to go look up the definition of assimilate. I didn't know what assimilation meant. I didn't even know what that could mean. How do I help somebody assimilate into something? I don't even know what assimilation means. So I had to go find the word assimilate to figure out what that means. 
But the reality is, is that many of us, like Lionel, Lionel confessed hope and faith in Jesus Christ years ago, turned, turned, you know, turned his back and, and went into uh, the belief of uh, an atheist belief. And then he's come back into this newer reality where it becomes something that's really, I believe, is more real than ever before to him. But the reality is, is that there are people that have confessed hope and faith in Jesus Christ, but they do not have the promises of God manifesting. I'm saying most of the people that have confessed hope and faith in Jesus Christ, they don't have these promises. That is unnatural. It's unnatural for you to come into the kingdom of God and stay broke. That's that's totally unnatural. You should not be in lack. I'm just saying. Then does that mean it doesn't happen? I'm not saying that. I'm saying that if it is a reality, it is a false reality and it's unnatural. It's unnatural for you to be sick and diseased and you've come into the kingdom of God. That is a that's an unnatural state. It's unnatural for you to have demons that are tormenting you where you can't sleep and you got thoughts of depression and suicide and you're addicted to, to drug and alcohol and, and porn and sex. That is unnatural. It's a violation of your rights and you have the power and authority in you. And God has made it so you are a citizen of his great kingdom and he wants to be responsible for you. So I'm saying it's unnatural. OK, so when when we're, when we're on here and we're sharing these truths about parables, don't miss the reality that God, that God, God through Jesus Christ is showing us the tools, the how to how does he how do these things work? And he's showing there's no way you're going to find out what Jesus Christ revealed there on your own. <laughs> you ain't going to find that out. It is revealed by someone who has seen it and he's telling us why that works. Why is that the case? OK, and he's telling you how this actually works out. So it's a powerful thing to understand those things. So thank you so much for uh, that, for Lionel, Lionel, for sharing those things. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and read these scriptures just because it's just these are ones that dropped on me as I was going through this. Uh, I encourage you to go and prove these out. Some of those are in alignment with some of the things I've shared. Some of those are just dealing with uh, kingdoms in general. OK. Uh, the first one is in Ephesians chapter six, and it's in verse number 12. And I'll read it again. It's Ephesians six, verse 12. And it says, for we wrestle not with flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Pay attention to what I'm saying. So the reason why I made sure that I put that there, because we understand we're not talking about physical flesh things. No, we're talking about spiritual things. And the reality is, is there are uh, so-called ruling spirits that think that they are, are in charge. Right. Now, in your absence, they seem like they're in charge, but in your presence, they shouldn't be in charge. Is that they not only are there, but they actually are in rank or in order. You're dealing with more like a, a military right, or a government. If you want to call it a kingdom, then you possibly can. I don't want to go as far as that only because when you understand normally with the, a kingdom, you spo you're supposed to have a king and that king is supposed to have a territory. But these angels were in God's host. Right. So they're used to operating in, in rank. They're used to operating in rank. So when they're here on this earth, they're still in rank and they still are very orderly. Right. Very rebellious, but still in order under the adversary. So he's telling you, hey, these are principalities, right? These are powers. These are rulers of, of darkness of this world, right? He calls them uh, the, this against spiritual wickedness and where in high places in the spirit realm. These are realities that we deal with. These are kingdom things. That's the reason why the kingdom of God is so vitally important. And we got to stop playing games with the kingdom of God because the, this, this, this group of people, they're trying to function as a pseudo kingdom, right? While we're trying to play religion in church, they're functioning like a kingdom, <laughs> right? And you wonder why they're causing so much havoc with so few, so, so few individuals, so few angels but causing so much havoc. But it's because they're very orderly and they work together, right? Jesus says, how can, how can Satan stand if he cast out himself? How can a kingdom stand against itself? How can a house stand against itself, right? Because they work together. You see the power of that and the unity of it? And he knows that if the body of Christ ever comes together, the citizens of, of, of God, if the, if the children of God, the priests and kings, right, come together and actually start to work together and stop with all the division, he knows ain't nothing he can do. He knows that. He knows that if we are speaking the kingdom of God and backing it up with power by the Holy Spirit and we're unified, we wreck shop. It's already happened, right, before uh, again, that, that guy, what is that guy's name? Uh, Constantine the Great is what he calls himself. 
before him. Look at the history. Rome was being torn to pieces. They didn't know what to do with the kingdom of God. <laughs> they didn't have anything to do. It was ripping them to shreds. Why? Because they were unified in the kingdom of God. They weren't divided in religion. They were unified under the kingdom of God and the king. That's the reason why, okay? I also look at Rome, uh, Romans chapter 8, verses 38 through 39. And it says, for I am persuaded that neither death nor life nor angels, and you'll see that word again, nor what? Principalities, right? These devils, right? And what they think in, they, in, in these ruling places, they can't separate you from the love of God, right? Look at it. It says, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor death, nor any other creature, right? So it calls these things creatures. They're created things shall be able to separate us, you and me, from what? The love of God, which is where? In Christ Jesus, our Lord, right? So even these, these um, principalities, these ruling offices, these, these, these forces, right? They, they can't separate us from the love of God, okay? Look at Luke chapter 10, verses 17 through 20. And it says, and the 70 returned again with joy, saying, Lord, even the devils, are subject unto us through thy name. And he said unto them, I beheld Satan as lightning fall from heaven. Behold, I give unto you power to tread on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy and nothing shall by any means hurt you. Notwithstanding in this rejoice not that the spirits are subject unto you, but Rather rejoice because your names are written in heaven. Isn't that a powerful thing? He says, I saw Satan cast out of heaven. Why are you tripping on him? Right? You shouldn't be surprised that you have the authority. He has none. You shouldn't be surprised at the power that you're operating in, which is the Holy Spirit, that is far more powerful than anything that he's got. That he's got. Don't be surprised about that. He said, don't have joy about that, but have joy that your name is written in heaven. Isn't it a powerful thing? Okay. And uh, a couple last scriptures. One is in first, first, uh, uh, first Kings chapter 11, verses 31 through 35. And I'll go ahead and read that. And he said to Jeroboam, take thee 10 pieces for, for thus saith the Lord, the God of Israel, behold, I will rend the kingdom out of the hand of Solomon and will give 10 tribes to thee, but he shall have one tribe for my servant David's sake and for Jerusalem's sake, the city which I have chosen out of all the tribes of Israel, because that they have forsaken me and have worshipped Ashtoreth, okay, the goddess of the Zidonians, uh, uh, Chemish, the god of the Moabites, and uh, Malcolm, the god of the children of Ammon, and have not walked in my ways to do that which I is right in mine eyes and to keep my statutes and my judgments as did David his father, how be it? I will not take the whole kingdom out of his hand, but I will make him prince all the days of his life for David my servant's sake, whom I chose because he kept my commandments and my statutes but I will take the kingdom out of his, his son's hand and I will give it unto thee, even 10 tribes. So around 930 BC, this is where the house of, of, of Israel actually separated. This is, this is outstanding stuff. Why? Because Jesus, I told you all the way back in, in uh, it was at Mark, uh, in Mark chapter three. And looking at the verse, I believe it was right around 24, 26, when Jesus states the reality and he reiterates and echoes that reality through the other parables that we saw, that no kingdom can stand divided. Oh, my gosh. Pay attention. This nation or kingdom of Israel was unstoppable. Unstoppable. Nobody or nothing can do anything against them when they were standing in the rightness or righteousness of God. When they were in the right standing with God, unstoppable. You have armies that go out to war and nobody get killed. You ain't never heard that before, right? No casualties. Everybody comes back in and they take the victory, right? This is a powerful thing. So when we see this, then because of their rebellion, then what happens is now this kingdom that is one becomes separated, right? 
and this is beginning of the fall for Israel because as they started to separate and have a northern part and a southern part, now they have wars between each other. How do you have a war between yourself, right? And, and numerous times throughout the Bible, you see the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom actually warring against each other. You see the northern kingdom taking off into exile and the southern king, kingdom remaining. Then you see the southern kingdom going into exile. Crazy stuff, right? But understand, we see the reality that what Jesus has, has, has told, told us is that the adversary knows is that you can, if you cause division, in a kingdom now you can you can have that that kingdom be conquered it will implode and destroy itself okay look at colossians chapter 1 verse number 13 and it says who hath delivered us from the power of darkness and has translated us into what into the kingdom of his dear son so i want to make sure i'm just making just just laying this thing down this kingdom 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 not me jesus christ is costly kingdom paul's kingdom right it's kingdom throughout this throughout this bible he's telling us what we need to know we just got to remove these blinders and actually see it for what it is okay and we have come into this great kingdom <laughs> it's a powerful thing right the kingdom of god we have come into it it has come into us also look into luke look at luke chapter 22 verses 29 through 30 and it says and i appoint unto you a kingdom as my father hath appointed unto me that ye may eat and drink at my table in my what? Kingdom and sit on thrones, judging the 12 tribes of Israel, right? Again, establishing a reality. God's giving you a kingdom. He's expecting you to anticipate the kingdom, right? Always the, the same reality. In 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse number 20, okay? It's the last one I'm going to end with. Now, this is, a, this is, this is, this is, look how short this is. But this is a, a mic drop verse or scripture. <laughs> you can say it and walk away, right? First Corinthians chapter four, verse number 20. For the kingdom of God ain't about a whole bunch of lip service, whole bunch of yickety yak and smackety smack, whole bunch of hypocrisy and, and false talking and promises that you can't keep. All type of uh, a puffed up conversation that you hear in, in all types of places, ain't about nothing. He says the kingdom of God is not in word. <laughs> what is it? He says it is in power. What is that power? It is the dudamus. Who is responsible for that dudamus? It is the presence of the Holy Ghost. You have that power in you. It is illegal for us to preach the gospel of the kingdom of God without signs and wonders, right? Without power. And what we hear all the time is if we even by chance hear anything about the kingdom of God is what? Whole bunch of words, whole bunch of words, right? But as a reality, it establishes the truth that this preaching of the kingdom should be unified and partnered with what? Power. Not just loud talking. I ain't talking about no loud talking. We talking about demons getting cast out. We talking about uh, hands being laid on the sick and they recovering, right? Maim arms growing out. People's organs coming back, right? We talking about restoration for for lost things that people have. Peace coming into their mind. People that have lived their whole lives in insanity and coming to a right mind and being able to hold a job start a business, operate it as government officials or whatever it is, something that's, that people say that there's no way that that person will be able to do. Power, right? Just a, just a wonderful, wonderful thing. So I'm done for tonight. Thank you so much for being able to hang in there. Uh, I'm excited uh, about what this should mean for the people who have ears to hear and eyes to see and have a heart of understanding, right? If that ain't you, fine. <laughs> find something else to do, right? But if, if this is you, if this is you and you have been waiting for this to manifest in your life, oh, it's going to be a wonderful time for you, right? These things will begin to manifest in your life and you will become everything that God intended for you to be. It's a powerful thing. So thank you again for your time. And if you're listening to this as a recording, if this has blessed you, listen to it multiple times like Lionel did, okay, with the last message. Uh, uh, prove the scriptures, actually go into these scriptures and reread them and prove them for yourself to make sure that they align and everything is right. Seek the guidance and leading of the Holy Spirit to be able to give you deeper revelation, understanding, right? 
And if it's something that really has helped you out, share it with somebody else. Share this message with somebody else. Pass it on to somebody else. Allow them to decide whatever they decide about it. Don't pick and choose. If they're if they're not a person that you believe is a believer, so what? Right? There's people right now that's uh that's that's so-called whores, is what they would call a person that's a prostitute, right? Somebody that's out right now that that's 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 in prostitution, somebody out right now selling drugs and using drugs, somebody that's out right now in a homosexual same sex relationships out right now, man dressed like a woman, a woman dressed like a man. You got all these people that's out there right now. Don't be trying to pick and choose, right? Those are people that could be a sheep of God waiting to hear the voice of God, waiting to hear the voice of Jesus Christ. And at the moment that they hear the voice of the shepherd, they're going to respond. <laughs> they're going to come right up out of that lifestyle. They're going to come right up out of whatever it is. And, and, and that's the thing we have to understand. It's not about trying to choose so-called religious people. The Sadducees and Pharisees, they missed it, man. They missed it. All the religious leaders, they missed it. Jesus Christ went into the, 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 to the streets to the poor. People that was downtrodden and cast out, people that everybody had forgotten, and he preached the gospel to these people. And these people had their whole lives revolutionized, and these people are the ones that were responsible for turning the world totally upside down. These people, right? So that's what God is actually looking for. So thank you. I'm done. Uh, any comments, any questions that you may have before we actually uh, end for tonight, I'm actually finished. Anything before we before we end for tonight? All right. Well, praise God. I'm done. Thank you again. Thank you, Lionel. Thank you, Bridget. Thank you, Emerson. Thank you, Pastor Mark. I know there's a number of people that will hear the recording that something happened. It could be in uh, work or family emergency or whatever it was that would have liked to be here with us. I just say thank you uh, for, for your presence and, and being able to, to support us uh, and what we're doing. If nothing else, what I'm asking that you do is, is petition, okay? Not just for me, petition uh, for the kingdom of God. Petition for your brothers and sisters all over the planet. Petition that, that, that the kingdom come into the hearts of God's children, right? into the hearts of those who are sheep of God, into the hearts of those whose, whose names are written in the book of life, ask that and petition, give God permission for his kingdom to come in our heart. Give, give per per permission for God's will to be done in response to God's kingdom coming inside the, of these people. These are, these are prayers, again, kingdom prayers. Pray this in your private time for our brothers and sisters, for me, right? Pray for all your brothers and sisters. Pray. That, that, that we have our daily bread, right? That, that man shall not live by bread alone, but every word that proceeded out of the mouth of God. We are supposed to live by the, the word of God. Is that pray for the, the uh, spiritual bread that we need on a day-to-day -day basis is that, that we receive it. All our brothers and sisters receive their daily bread. Pray for it. Thank God. Thank God. Oh, God, thank you that, that our needs are getting met, not just spiritually, but also physically, right? That, that our physical needs are being met, that we have our bread day by day, day to meet our needs, right? Petition, give God permission, not just for you, but for your brothers and sisters to have that manifest in their lives, right? Just just, just being, be thankful that God has forgiven us from, from, from all of our sins and our debts, right? And because he's done that, make sure that you're petitioning to you, that your brothers and sisters will forgive everybody that has sinned against them and has a debt and they think owes them an apology, right? <laughs> They don't owe you anything. Release them. Pray that your brothers and sisters release those people that they're trying to hold in bondage, thinking that those people owe them something. Pray that God doesn't uh, lead us into temptation, right? There's no reason for it. But if we're in rebellion and won't listen, then maybe the best thing for some people is to be led into temptation to get their butts whooped a little bit so they can actually get into a right mind and come, come to themselves, right? But pray for your brothers and sisters, petition that they not be led into, into temptation. Pray that we not be led into temptation. Pray that we that, that we be delivered from evil and the evil one, right? There's a lot of stuff that's going on. We should have no part of, right? Pray for your brothers and sisters to be delivered from, 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 from evil. All signs and traces of evil, wherever it might lie, or wherever it might be. Pray that and also acknowledge that it is God's kingdom. It is God's power and it is God's glory, right? Acknowledge that, right? Acknowledge that and ask for that reality to manifest in the lives of our brothers and sisters all over the planet, right? 
and understand if we acknowledge that reality that is his then those things will begin to manifest because we're stewards of what god's kingdom right we're stewards of god's glory we're stewards of god's power right so those things should manifest in our lives as we acknowledge whose it is and it says forever right so those things will never change whether we come into agreement or not but it benefits us as, as we come into agreement with that so that's it for tonight have a great night i look forward lord willing that we can get together again next thursday that we will do it again have a blessed evening